I thought I'd just jump straight in and ask, so having studied natural sciences at Cambridge, your route into comedy was perhaps an unexpected one. What inspired you to become more involved in the comedy sphere at university and then pursue it as a full-time career? Mm. Sorry, I've no idea. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I think I think I um, well, I always loved comedy when I was growing up, um, and uh, I particularly loved uh, Monty Python. I don't know if anybody here is a fan of Monty Python, but I, I kind of found that my you know, my whole life started to make sense once I saw Monty <laughs> Python. <laughs> and I just remember thinking, oh, I'd love to do that. You know, I mean, could, I remember thinking, could that possibly be a job? And then, um, and then learning a bit about Monty Python, I think I was really excited to discover that Monty Python, you know, the members of, of Monty Python had been... Um, they'd been students, you know, they'd been... Uh, to Oxford and to Cambridge and they were bright people and I kind of I, I sort of loved the idea I, I loved the um, I loved the reading that seemed to have gone on behind Monty Python I loved this you know um, you know songs about well-known Chinese rivers <laughs> <laughs> did a lot for me you know kind of thought, wow these are people like me the, the uh, people who are interested in lots of different things, um, but find them funny and want to find them funny and want to sort of do something, want to be funny about things in a new way. And I found that really, 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 really exciting. So I sort of always had that in my mind. That would be great if I could do that at some point. And, and then um, and you've got to pick a subject, haven't you? Um, <laughs> you've all done it. Um, you've got to pick something to, to, to go and study. So. You know, I've always loved, uh, I always loved physics, and I, you know, really, really liked the idea of studying that as well. I thought that'd be very, I thought that'd be, it was partly a lazy choice because <laughs> I, um, I did start doing art, art, sort of arts A levels at school, and I remember going to, you know, I remember going to a sort of Eng uh, sort of a history class and suddenly realizing how much work was involved. <laughs> An awful lot of remembering things. Yeah. And that's never been one of my strong points. So I thought I'd be better off doing subjects you don't really have to remember anything for. And like physics and maths are perfect because you basically can pretty much write down on one sheet of paper everything you really need to know, um, you know, to do a, uh, well, to do a physics <laughs> degree. <laughs> <laughs> I think the physicists here will bear that out. I mean, it's, it's you know, I know you're a physicist because we spoke earlier and, uh, you know, it's, it's a kind of, it's a lazy man's uh, subject. <laughs> um, so I picked that because I thought it'd give me, you know, lots of spare time as well. And, uh, and I, <laughs> I sort of, yeah, then I kind of fell into doing, I fell into doing comedy. Actually, I started doing the comedy when I was doing my PhD, so... When I was doing my, uh, when I did my undergraduate, um, I, I ran a disco. <laughs> <laughs> I was the entertainments officer for oh, my college yeah. and uh, I ran a disco. Um, and uh, I think that was my first sort of toe in the water of show business. I thought, this is, this is great fun. I wonder if there's anything else, any other, you know, opportunities available. And then, yeah, then I started, got, got involved in Footlights when I was doing, um, doing my PhD. So I started... Yeah, I just, um, I said, yeah, I just, uh, you know, I just started writing, I don't know why I did it. I just started writing sketches and sending them to the Footlights. And then I started performing at Footlight Smokers. And I think Smokers are great. I don't know if you have those, those, um, you know, the Oxford Review. But basically, uh, s Smokers, for anybody who doesn't know, are, the, are it's sort of an open house within Footlights every week. There's a show at the ADC Theatre, and basically anybody can be in it. So it's kind of like an open, it's basically an open night. Um, and yes, yeah, so I started performing at Smokers, and then you know sort of got involved in Footlights from then on. And then once I was in Footlights, I started to, you know, started to read a little bit about the history of Footlights, and kind of start to understand that, you know, that's where all the people 
I mean, of course, I'd known this, known this before, but understood on an emotional level that the, the comedians that I really loved had trod that same path, you know, and I think that ma made me think, wow, and that's, well, you know, I mean, mm. this is worth a shot. <laughs> Yeah, that's quite interesting. It's a long so answer to your question. No, it's sorry. a great answer. <laughs> Virtually as long as my degree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you mentioned like Mon Monty Python kind of inspired you. Yeah. And I know that also Morecambe and Wise were quite influential as like yes. comedic yeah. icons. What about them did you find so captivating? And do you think any of their material, their style transcended into your like dynamic with Alexander Armstrong? Yeah, definitely. Well, the other, yeah, because the other, it was Monty, Monty Python and Morecambe and Wise when I, when I was you know, growing up and watching comedy. And the thing that I got from Morecambe and Wise was, was the love between them. It was the idea of a double act. You know, the idea of, um, I mean, they, they, had, they were a certain archetype of double act that you don't really, that you don't really see anymore, where they had a kind of, you know, there was the, they called at the time uh, straight man, funny man, you know. So that was a slightly, um, you know, that... It wasn't that aspect of it. It was more to do with, um, I mean, quite often when we started, we used to we used to play the same character. We used to be the same character in a do a double act where we were both the same person, which we used to quite en quite enjoy. Um, and uh, and the common thread is that is that it was it, what I was doing with Zada is really combining the two things that we loved so we were, Mon we were Monty Python and Malcolm and Wise and kind of doing Monty Python but in a sort of double act so with surreal characters and you know surreal sketches but unlike Monty Python our sketches weren't based on the uh, Monty Python sketches are, pre uh, sorry, I get, always get into comedy theory and I know this, to, as we were doing this earlier and I was saying, I'm, I, I must apologise, but this bit will be short. <laughs> so uh, Mo Monty Python is premise based, essentially. So you start out with a comic premise and you then, you know, follow that through logically. And usually at the end of the sketch, there's some sort of reversal or punchline or um, or quite often in Monty Python, just somebody else wanders into the sketch and, you know, uh, it doesn't really end. They just start another sketch. Um, and I think one of the reasons they have to do that in Monty Python is, unfortunately, if you start with the premise, you have to sort of work all the way through and you get to this awful moment at the end of every sketch where you have to come up with a punchline, which is somehow satisfying the narrative of the sketch and really funny and twists the premise in some way. And it's an absolute nightmare. And... And uh, you can spend, you can lose years of your life uh, doing that. So we we found our own way out of it, which was to always have to use the the um, to have stories, to have characters and stories. So our sketches were really just stories. They were short stories that just had a beginning, middle, and an end. And you could just end the story would be a way to end the sketch. You didn't have to have a punchline at the end. So I suppose that was borrowing something from. Morecambe and Wise, really, who did the same thing. They would have na their sketches in their show would quite often be just little narrative stories between the two of them. So, mm -hmm. Kind yeah. of on that tangent, so when you started the Armstrong and Miller show, it was a series of skits which hadn't been seen on television for a while. What was sort of your creative process behind that show and what kind of made you think, oh, I think skits and having this sort of double act would work really well where we play these surrealist characters? Um... It would be nice if we'd. Um, it would be nice if we'd been as methodical as you suggest. <laughs> it was more to do with the fact. Um, it was stand-up was really really popular at the time when we started, so everywhere was stand-up. Every show was no sketch shows on TV. Every, there was no sketch comedy clubs. Um, there were no sketch acts because I think partly because uh, first Monty Python, then not the nine o'clock news, had been so successful in the sort of seventies, eighties that you know, and then sort of Al Fresco and um, you know Stephen Fry and Hugh Laurie, they they kind of you know they they'd done a sort of there'd been a sort of renaissance of sketch comedy then, but then but then it had died and it had gone away and there hadn't really been anything. And there'd been this huge surge of interest in stand-up. So everybody was doing stand-up. There were stand-up comedy clubs everywhere. Um, 
you know, I mean, I mean, I think there was a appalling statistic like um, <laughs> nine out of 10 men between the ages of 14 and 18 at the time was a stand-up comedian. <laughs> I mean, these were desperate, tragic, <laughs> tragic <laughs> times. Um, I mean, it was horrendous. Do you know what I mean? And stand-up was everywhere. And, um, and I remember just thinking, we don't, I don't really like, I mean, I like stand-up comedy, but it's not really my thing. I like doing characters. And we were so desperately thinking how we might do something. And there wasn't really anywhere to do it. So we started a comedy club um, in London at the Gate Theatre. Um, and after the main show had finished, we would do, um, we would do, so the, there's always a, certain nights of the week there's a gap. So some, some days there's a matter, there's two shows, but on, on a night, they've got a set there, they've got a theatre there, and we figured out that, you know, on like on, if we went along on a Wednesday night, when they never, we didn't only had one show and it would finish, if it was a short show as well, so it finished like at 10, then we could get in there at 11 and do a comedy show for an hour. And so we had this, um, and we did it on the Second City model. So it was called TVA and it was in London. And uh, during the Second City model, so the first half of the show would be sketches that had worked in previous shows. Um, sorry, the first half would be new stuff. Excuse me. <clears throat> and the second half would be stuff that had worked in previous shows. So you could try out, you had half an hour to try out, you know, new sketches and new characters. And then the audience could then have something to laugh at after it. <laughs> <laughs> when you did the sketches and characters that had worked before and worked again. So it was really that, and we just did that for a couple of years, and there was no way, and people would come, you know, TV producers would come and see this show, and they would say, oh, it's very funny, it's wonderful, and they're queuing around the block, aren't they? There's no way we can ever put this on television because it's not stand-up, and then they would leave. Um, and so it was kind of, we would start, every, everybody, but then more and more people started doing it, you know, so then Matt and Dave, um, you know, who became Little Britain, started doing it. The League of Gentlemen started doing it. Um, sketch comedy, that is. And, um, you know, then we, you started some comedy clubs would then let you do a sketch sometimes at the end of the, you know, as long as it was at the end of the evening and everyone was drunk and wouldn't, po you know, couldn't possibly remember. Um, and, and, then, and then suddenly the far show came on and suddenly sketches were, uh, were in and somebody had made a funny sketch show, so suddenly it was like, um, uh, is there anybody out there who can, who can do sketches? You know, we've got to get a show on immediately. So then, it, and, and we were just all, you know, lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time, really. Mm. You know. So what I mean, what I, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that we just really loved doing it. We just, we did it because we really, really loved doing it. And it was a, at the time, it was a terrible business decision. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I remember doing a stand-up, because I was still doing stand-up at the time, because I had to make some money. So I'd, I'd occasionally do stand-up gigs to try and support myself. And I did a gig with Harry Hill, and I remember driving home with him from Brighton. And um, he said, you're like one of those, those gentlemen's outfitters, he said, that you see in Burlington Arcade. He said, you're making things that nobody wants. <laughs> Nobody wants sketch comedy. They never want it again. He said, but you love to make your little tweedy sketch comedy, but no one is ever going to want to watch it. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, yeah, at the time he had a point. I remember thinking, oh yeah, this is never, this, isn't go this is going nowhere. So. Kind of in that sense, what do you think dictates the fad of comedy? So I think no, currently panel shows seem to be dominating the comedy space. Have I got news for you? QI. What do you think it takes to get an audience to be like, oh, this is the type of genre or strand of comedy that's in, that's in fashion? Well, I mean, I think, I just don't think there's much of a, you know, I don't think it's any great mystery really. I mean, I think the problem is that people who work in TV they think in terms of formats, you know, so they think, um, um, oh, you know, this, this sketch show, the fast show is popular, then, oh, we need to make another, uh, we need to make another sketch show. As if the audience is sitting at home going, well, that sketch show was rather amusing. I think, I think I'd watch another sketch show if it was, <laughs> as the audience don't care, do they? I mean, they're just, they're just like, oh, that's, that's quite funny. I'll watch it. Um, so I don't think, so there's two things going on. One is the audience just like funny shows, 
And you know, if it's a bad panel show, they won't watch it. If it's a good one, they will watch it. It's, it's just like, a, you know, it's just a bit like playing, you know, people have a run of luck. You know, you have a run of luck in any one format. And um, if there suddenly is a panel show that's really popular, then the people in telly then make lots more panel shows. And of course, statistically, some of those will be successful. And, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a, it makes no sense whatsoever, really. I mean, for example, you hear things, you know, you know, people will say no, but they don't want to do. They don't. They're not. They don't want sketch shows at all at the moment. Or you know, they don't want panel shows. Panel shows really aren't working. Or sitcoms. No, absolutely no. No, absolutely. Oh, is it hit? Great. Sitcoms. No, sitcoms. <laughs> Definitely sitcoms. Sitcoms. No panel shows. No panel shows. Just sitcoms. Uh, but only sitcoms with single camera. Uh, you know, shot single. Oh, it's multi camera. It's a hit. Only multi-camera. <laughs> I mean, it's just ridiculous. I mean, the audience, you know, the audience don't care. They want something. They want, well, you know, the audience don't know what they want. That's the thing, is it? The audience want to be surprised and excited and to, be f and to feel like human beings and to, um, you know, commune with their fellow spirits. You know, you can't, you can't put, you, <laughs> you can't write that on a brief. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> channel 4, can you? Yeah. Well, actually, at Channel 4, they probably would. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Do you think also the recent strand of comedy where it's sort of parodying the current political climate, do you think that's sometimes dangerous, the idea of satirising something and then perhaps normalising it? So dangerous in, in, in what sense? In know? the sense, perhaps, like with SNL and Alec Baldwin doing Trump sketches. Do you think it you kind mean of... mean it normalises the idea of... Yeah, that yeah. This, is, this is reality. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I think it gets two as a few, I mean, there's a few interesting things in there, aren't there? I mean, um, you know, I love satire. I lo I've never really done satire, but I absolutely love it. I, I wrote for a satirical show, um, a, ra a satirical radio show for, for a while. Um, and I've done, you know, some bits in satirical shows. And I, I, I love to watch them, do you know what I mean? And I think, you know, I think they can be, you know, I think, the question is, can they, do they, do they have any effect? Do they have any, you know, do they have a political effect? And I don't know that they really, I don't know that they really do or ever have done. That doesn't mean they're not funny. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I love the SNL, you know, I love the SNL sketch. I love John Oliver. I love, you know, I, I understand more about the news from watching John Oliver than I do from watching the news. <laughs> I mean, he's really good. I mean, he's so, I mean, he's so sharp um, and he's funny. But I think the main thing is he's funny. You know, I don't think, does he have a, you know, is there a John Oliver effect? I, I doubt there is one politically. I mean, I doubt that really, you know, um, yeah, I doubt that has much uh, sway with the voting public, really, because those of us who read and and you know and watch television and films? We are quite a small minor minority, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're even reading a newspaper, you're really in a in a whole. You know, that's a whole you know world apart <laughs> from where most people are at. Yeah. And then also, do you think the current climate of political correctness sometimes encroaches? on a comedian's ability to just do their job. And you have to always be second guessing the type of material you're presenting. Do you think it has that effect or do you think it's just a natural thing now, right now? I don't know, I mean, people talk about, you know, people have always, I, all throughout the whole time I've been doing comedy, people have always talked about political correctness. Um, you know, uh, I mean, you need to know what your joke's about, I mean, Let's put it like that. You know, you need to. I mean, uh, there, there, are, there are comedians who do. There are plenty of comedians who don't follow this rule and are very, very successful. So, you know, it's just, this is, uh, you know, uh, this is by no means uh, an opinion generally held among uh, the comedy profession. You know, within the comedy profession. But I would say you need to know what your jokes are about, and you need to make sure that you know what the target of your joke is, and you need to be happy that your joke is hitting that target um, apart from anything you're committing a lot of you're committing a lot of resources you know there's a huge amount of money to film something and 
um, you want to feel, you want to really, really understand what it is that you're doing. You know, so say you write, you know, so you, um, you know, say we did a sketch about this, uh, or what's happening now, you know, somebody being interviewed, you know, um, at the Oxford Union. Mm -hmm. There are certain obvious sort of comedy directions to take that in. <laughs> yeah, what would that skit be like? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, well, Oxford, the Oxford Union wouldn't come out of it very well. <laughs> That tends to be the case. Uh, you, uh, but but you, you, you understand what I'm saying. You know, you'd have to, and if you wanted a, you know, and if you were, and you were making that sketch, and you're thinking, well, you know, I think the Oxford Union is a really good thing, and I think the Oxford Union has tremendous values, and it's not what people think it is, then you have to be really um, meticulous about how you construct the sketch that you're constructing so that it does the job that it's supposed to do. And, you know, and, and you don't accidentally hit a target that you're not intending to hit. I suppose that's the point. So in that sense, um, you know, you have, you, you apply your own political, what you call political correctness, you have your own political judgment, don't you? It's part of your own judgment about taste, part of your own judgment about politics you know, your own judgment about what, whatever it is that you're making the, the um, joke about, and then uh, it's, and it, uh, everybody else is right to, to disagree or dislike mm -hmm. the target that you've chosen and the way, and the accuracy, and to, you know, debate the accuracy with which you've hit that target. You know, I think, uh, you know, it's a sort of, that sounds like a politician's answer to the question. Mm -hmm. Um, what I, I suppose what I really want to say is, I, is ne I've never felt that political correctness constrains comedy. Mm -hmm. You know, comedy is already, if you're doing it properly, it's already incredibly constrained anyway. So that what someone's idea about, you know, their politics or, y you, know, you know, I mean, I don't, uh, you know, I don't really care what Nigel Farage thinks about my mm -hmm. sketches. I don't care mm -hmm. because I don't respect his political opinion. So. So it's politically correct for me, it's politically incorrect for, you know, Nigel Farage. And I'm really quite okay with that. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I suppose, you know, I think, uh, on the one hand, I want to say, you know, because we always, want, we always want to have a sort of Daily Mail opinion and go, oh, political correctness is ridiculous, you can't say anything anymore. You never could. You know, you never could. You know, even in, I mean, in the bombast of the lads' culture of 1994, you couldn't say exactly what you wanted, you had to know who's, what your target was and, mm -hmm. and why you were aiming at it. Okay, great. I think people have heard enough from me, so I'd love to open up questions to the floor. You've probably heard enough from me as well. <laughs> <but it's fair. laughs> um, if you just wait, the mic will be passed to you. So does anyone have a question? Okay, yeah, the second row. Yeah, and if you stand up when you see your questions, that'd be great, thank you. Um, hello, um, I hope it's all right, but I'm going to ask a question about physics. Oh, um, <laughs> um, I was just curious how much it's still a part of your life, because obviously like, you left a PhD for comedy, but um, is science, like, because you wrote two books as well, so is science still quite a big part of your life, or would you say that you're 100% comedy now? Um, I still love, uh, I, yeah, I will always, always love physics. I don't, I don't have any plans to write, I'm just doing comedy at the moment. Um, but uh, I still have a huge interest in all the, in, you know, in, in the last uh, science book that I, I wrote, I imagine you've all got it, is uh, about <laughs> the search for extraterrestrial life. Um, you know, I think that's a uh, fascinating subject. What I'd really like to do now is, you know, not immediately, but at some point in the future, I'd like to, to do some, you know, uh, creative writing and you know around those around those sorts of subjects you know that's something I haven't done yet which I really like to do um, but uh, no I'll always I'll always love I'll always love uh, I'll always love physics <laughs> 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 yeah I mean I just think I the only thing I would say about physics I mean no disrespect to uh, you are physics for me by the way during this <laughs> what's your name uh, Rob. Rob Rob is physics basically. <laughs> you're you're great you know don't get me wrong um, but <laughs> I, if I was, if I was uh, studying science now, again, no disrespect, I might pick a different uh, strand of science. I just think that, I, I think bio, uh, there's so much fantastic biology going on. I find that really, really um, 
amazing. I mean, we're sort of at a, a stage with biology that I don't think anybody thought would be possible sort of 20 years ago, where we're kind of really getting the hood off, you know, um, the hood off living things and trying to figure out, you know, what's, uh, how it all, you know, how it all works. I think uh, for me as well, I, mean, I think life is a, I think this is kind of a obvious thing to say, but life is not a sort of, you know, life is a quantum, it seems to me it's obvious, it's a sort of quantum phenomenon. It's not, you know, the experience of being alive, to me, is not, is not one I recognise in Rob's books. And what and what I what I what I mean, <laughs> what I mean is I love physics because it's kind of you it, it's sort of very elementary and you can reduce things to very you can make things very simple, um, uh, but you know by and large what we enjoy about it is that you know we start out again it's a bit like you know a bit like a Monty Python sketch you start out with a premise you can work through to some sort of con some sort of conclusion because life it really doesn't appear to be like that and I think that's you know I think we're getting closer and closer to some kind of, you know, of understanding of what life might possibly be. And I, was, I, I find that as really, really, I never imagined, you know, when I was studying science at university that we'd get anywhere near as close as we're getting to some of those, to some of those um, subjects. Does that answer your question? Yeah. What do you study? Chemistry. Chemistry, oh, terrible subject. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, if we go towards the back, the member in the like copper jumper. <laughs> He's actually made of copper. I yeah. think. <laughs> Could you tell me your um, your desert island comedy sketches? Oh yes. Um, oh. Oh my goodness. Um, well, I've got to have a Monty. I've got to have a. Say, can I, let's say I can have three for the sake of argument. Um, I definitely have a Monty Python sketch in that. I think I probably have the World Hide and Seek Championship, <laughs> which is like one of the first. I mean, uh, partly for emotional reasons because um, it was the first. I just remember seeing a really, really. It was a light bulb moment for me watching that on TV and thinking, oh, that's, I, just, I just thought it was the funniest thing that I'd ever seen. I couldn't, ima I couldn't imagine how someone could even begin to think of that. And I, I just, it was so, also it's just so different to anything else that I'd seen. So I kind of, yeah, yeah, I totally, totally have um, the World Hide and Seek Championship. I think, um, oh God, I mean, Fry and Laurie have so many brilliant, brilliant sketches. I think that one where those two businessmen saying a, a pint of, a pint of dam and a pint of double dam and all, <laughs> the sort of the, uh, what are they calling it? The kind of middle management businessman one that they do in sort of various, various chain hotels. Does anybody know what that sketch is actually called? I just, I think they're absolutely, I think they're absolutely fantastic, um, Fry and Laurie. And I kind of, again, they were sort of, you know, you kind of think, when, when you were, you know, trudging that lonely road through early adulthood, as I was, and you had Monty Python, and then very little to hang on to again, before you had, uh, you know, Fry and Laurie, I think I'd definitely have something from them. And then, and then I have to, there's a little, there's um. Oh God, there's this uh, most fantastic League of Gentlemen sketch. I saw them do live, I saw them do their live, because we were sort of doing our, we were all doing live stuff around about the same time. And Mark Gatiss did this just brilliant, um, brilliant, brilliant character where he is showing <laughs> um, some tourists, he's in the sort of Cheddar Caves or something, he's showing the tourists around, the sort of stalactites and stalagmites and, you know, uh, it, it's just absolutely, I mean, I can't remember it, you know, I, not remembering the, the exact words, but it'd be sort of, you know, be shining his sort of torch going, Eamon Holmes, 
you know, at a particularly Eamon Holmes looking satellite, <laughs> uh, stalactite or something. And then he, as he's telling this story, it's the most brilliant thing, as he's telling the story, he starts to recount an earlier trip down the mine. And he says this line, I think he says, I still see the child's face as he slipped into the water. Or something <laughs> like that. That's <laughs> just... That's just brilliant. That's absolutely fantastic. I remember him just doing that on stage with just a torch, just in a dark, you know, like in a... wherever it was, wherever it was a pub or something, a dark canal cafe theatre or something, and a torch and just pointing it round, and we were all in the dark and then doing this thing. Absolutely brilliant. I think they're amazing, the League of Gentlemen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If we go actually to the, yeah. Hi. So um, I really like the uh, the fighter pilot sketch, the Armstrong and Miller one. And I was just wondering what your favourite sketch that you and Alexander Armstrong did was. Oh, thank you. Um, I I do like that one. That was really, really good fun. Uh, really good fun to do. Um, the, the, I'm, my favourite one is is a bit weird. I just loved doing it at the time. So it's it's in our. So we did sort of, t I think we, I don't know, I think it's seven or eight series altogether. But with the first, the first half of those were on Channel Four, and then, yeah, and then we did some more on BBC One. So be before we did the ones on BBC One, we did a series on Channel Four, and I think about the second or third series of those, we had a sketch that still makes me laugh. It's the, um, it's going to. I'm not expecting anyone to find it funny now when I recount it, <laughs> by the way. But it's basically this. It's the Euro 96, the story of England's progress through the Euro 96 football championship, as told by um, the Beatles. <laughs> so it's really... <laughs> I just love to do it, and I've never really understood why... It, was funny and it and it was we couldn't understand we didn't really get it at the time either so basically you go through the story of the Beatles you know from them forming in the cavern club but there's like four guys playing football on the stage and then and then and and then you know it's in the style of because uh, it pastiches various different Beatles films as well as it goes through so it starts off pastiching sort of hard day's night where they do that weird dialogue where the they all talk like that and say, climb out of the window, you know, sort of, are you, coming to, are you coming to play some football, Ted? And one of them's Teddy Sheringham and the other one's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> are you coming to play some football, Teddy? My man won't let me. Climb out of the window. You know, it's all that sort of editing that they used to do in 60s films. So there's no gap between any of the dialogue. I just found it. So we were like, cop, you know, copying little bits like that. And then it goes all the way. Anyway, I cut a long story short, ends, ends with let it be with them playing football on the roof of the Apple building. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and uh, dressed as the Beatles, but it's, you know, it, it's Gazza and Teddy Sheringham and all the other stars of Euro 96. <laughs> Still makes me laugh. <laughs> I can't believe we got to do that. I just can't believe we got to do that. Neither can you. <laughs> Yeah. Um, if we can go to the front, yeah. The member in, no, no, the front, the member in the red top. And if you could stand up when you say your question, please. Thank you. Um, so my question is, do you miss working in the Caribbean? And what was it like um, moving to kind of serious acting from comedy? Well, two points there. First of all, that wasn't serious acting. <laughs> 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 And I hated the Caribbean. No, um, I would have loved, I mean, I loved some things about being in the Caribbean. I did not enjoy being in the Caribbean in the summer in a wool Marks and Spencer's suit. Um, but, you know, we, we decided that that was funny at the beginning, you know, uh, and then I was stuck in the, in the thing for, for years <laughs> afterwards. And you just, it just became absolutely unbearable because in 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 guadeloupe in the summer so you start to get to about this time of year what are, what are we in um so may it would be this is the time of year we would start filming you get out there and it would be about 32 30 33 degrees now and we would start in may so we get out there then and i'd be wearing a wool 
suit. I can't stress that enough. A wool suit from Marks and, Sp <laughs> from Marks and Spencer. <laughs> right? And um, by the time you get to July, so you've been there for two months, the temperature would quite often be like 42 degrees or 43 degrees. So that's the kind of heat, and this is wet, so it's wet as well, it's very, very humid. The reason we were filming then is because nobody, go every hotel is empty in the summer in the Caribbean because nobody goes unless they're absolutely insane because <laughs> it's so hot. But it's incredibly humid, so you, you, sweating is no good, basically. If you were just to go out in, if you just go out in ordinary, clo you know, ordinary clothes, light, like a t-shirt and shorts and stuff, and you, you doused yourself with water the whole time, you'd stand a pretty good chance of ending up in A&E. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's just so ridiculously hot. And I was wearing a wool <laughs> suit <laughs> for three years, <laughs> for seven months at a pop. I wore a wool suit in the Caribbean <laughs> for 21 <laughs> months. So did I, do I miss being in, you know, I don't think so, but why did you leave? Do you think like, yeah, yeah, I, I missed the show because it was brilliant, brilliant fun and I loved the character, I loved doing the character and, and the writing was fantastic and I loved the bonkersness of it. Um, I loved the fact, what I always loved about the show was it wasn't like anything else and it was of a completely new tone. So it was when Scandinavian noir was just becoming popular and you know the wire had just been on and everything was incredibly gritty and hard hitting and the first re i just remember the first reviews that we got which is just going this doesn't make any sense i mean why is he be i mean i mean if he knows he's guilty why doesn't he just arrest them why does he get them all together in a room at the doesn't make any sense i mean the people were trying to it's not like the wire um <laughs> you know I mean, and um i remember just uh, you know, loving that and thinking uh, because it was a l it seems like a very safe show now but actually it wasn't a very safe show when it started it was, it was taking a big risk with the, with, the to with the tone there wasn't anything I mean I'm not aware of anything that's that close to, to comedy that's played as a as a sort of um, you know what the Americans called murder mystery kind of thing I don't think, think of anything like that and the tone of the show is very hard to do. So when we started out filming, I mean, it was less so later on, and particularly because I was wearing a wool suit. <laughs> but, uh, but early on, we used to film a lot of different takes. So we'd film like a sad, quite serious take. Because usually someone had just been cut in half by a bandsaw or, you know, fallen off a 15-storey building in a wedding dress or something quite bad had happened, probably like a minute and a half before we would, you know, having some pretty inconsequential conversation um, as, in a scene. So we're never quite sure, like, is this going to, will, will it play? Will it be funny if we, if we, you know, do we need to just at least do a nod to the fact that their daughter's just died? I mean, we just do this, we play like various sort of tone things and quickly figured out actually it was, it was, fi it was fine. You could just always play the, you know, you couldn't play that if it was too comic, then you didn't really care about the story. You didn't care about the story. So it was like a, always a balance between too funny that, you know, too funny that you just would never come back from making a cup of tea. <laughs> or, um, you know, or, or, not, or not, funny, not funny enough to hide the massive logical inconsistencies. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Um, if we go to the front row. Sarah Pascoe has been one of the driving forces behind setting up the um, UK Comedy Guild, uh, which is a, a union for stand-up comedians that supports their rights if, um, you know, for instance, they get heckled off stage before doing their full time and then don't get paid. Um, is that something that you support and you would have found valuable uh, when you just started out? Could you just repeat that question? I mean, she's doing what? There's going to be a comedy guild, and if you get heckled off stage, you can get your, you get your paid anyway. That's well, the I don't quite get the... It's a, a union for stand-up comedians, and, and that's the sort of uh, ethos behind it. But is it to protect them from, uh, you know, harassment of, of any kind, or is it...? Well, it's, it's to protect their right to get paid if they do a gig and then 
um, for instance, get heckled off stage and then don't get paid as a result of that. Oh God, that's a, yeah, that's a brilliant idea. I had no idea she was doing that. It's a fantastic idea. I mean, I have to say my own experience, having been heckled off stage many times, <laughs> uh, when I was starting out, I did always get, I did always get paid. Um, and I was, uh, you know, as I, as I was saying earlier on, I'm, I was never one for sticking around. You know, if it, wasn't, if it wasn't going well, I would just say, thank you very much, good night, just leave pretty much immediately. Um, and, but I always did, I, I always did get paid. I mean, that'd be outrageous to not, because uh, it's, sometimes it's completely out of your control. And some, in some clubs, it's actually set up so that you get heckled off. So it's a bit of so, sport, you know, only in certain clubs. The vast majority obviously want the, you know, want the acts to go well. But, you know, there are some clubs that are set up so that people get heckled off. You know, it's all part of the fun. Um, so she's doing that. That's brilliant. I can only imagine that comes from some experience where that she's had where or she's heard, you know, she's known of other people not get paid. I mean, the thing is, when you're doing stand up comedy, you, you know, it's pretty. I was not. I mean, maybe things have changed, but it's not it's not it's not a very well paid job as far as I remember. And you pretty much surviving from gig to gig. And you usually, you know. Yeah, I mean. It, it, uh, I don't know. I, my experience of it was I always really, really needed the money. I mean, I, I needed the money m even more than I hated doing stand-up comedy. Because <laughs> I found it, I did, I, it wasn't, you know, I, I, it didn't feel like it was my thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's good for you just, her. Yeah, pass the mic. What a <laughs> I was wondering whether there are any sort of up and coming comedians that you're a particular fan of. Um, yeah, lo I mean, just I just love. I mean, I love comedy. I watch it all the time. Um, there's, God, Phoebe Waller Bridge is amazing. Sarah Pascoe is amazing. I love Sarah Pascoe's stand up. I think I love uh, people. People just do nothing. I think it's one of the best shows I've ever. Seen, I think they're all they're all fantastic. You know, they're all fantastic in that show. Um, God, there's some such great stuff. I don't know if anyone seen that show, that French show, Call My Agent. That's amazing. It's on Netflix. Um, I only discovered it a couple of weeks ago. Just absolutely, br absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah, you know, and I l I'm a huge fan of lots of American comedy as well. You know, so uh, we talked about. John Oliver and stuff, but you know, I'm a big fan of. Uh, I love American stand. I just something about American stand up for me. It just feels, just feels. Uh, you know, it just really does the trick. Um, there's lots of English stand ups that I love, but it's, it's something about the scale of America. It's like one person with a microphone and against America. Do you know what I mean? It just feels like more epic to me than. <laughs> One person against Leicester, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of God. There's almost too too many to mention. I think we're having a great period, uh, particularly for uh, female comedians at the moment. It's like all the best, so, so much of really really great stuff. You know, Amy Schumer, and you know, I just uh, amazing stuff coming out at the moment. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, we could be really could be here all day just talking about that. Yeah, we go to yeah. the second row. Remember in the flat pony. Yeah. Um, so during those years at Cambridge, when you began to write and perform your first few sketches, do you remember your process then? Was it a flash of comedic inspiration, or did you hack away at something until you thought you could use it? And then when you moved into doing TV and writing, sort of volumes of sketches became really an important part of your living. Did your process change at all? Yes. Oh, love. What a lovely question. Thank you. Um, I um, yes, it does. It does change. I think it goes very much sort of by inspiration. When it's certainly it did for me when you start out. When you, the first few times, you know, the first few times that you write a sketch, it's almost like, mm, I didn't know that was going to happen. You know, it was almost like a kind of, um, oh, okay. <laughs> I wonder if that'll happen again. Um, and then, of course, pretty soon you need to get into a frame of mind where, you know, you, there is a pro you know, there is a there is a process, and you have some kind of, I, you know, you're you're in, in touch with something. And I think what what I've, you know, what, Z Zandra and I've, had an, 
a number of things that we did that we do and that we did do and that we developed towards that. Um, First of all, I think it really, really helps to know what it is you're trying to write in the first place. So you think, rather than just think, I want to write a sketch, just think, I want to write a sketch about something, is a really good place to start. And then what we, use, what we do is we have a, a set of rules between us as well of, of what, can, what can be in the sketch. So, for example, one of our rules would be no references to the real world. There can't be any reference in the sketch to anything, any real person or anything that happens in the real world. And to, to a certain extent, you can bend those rules sometimes, you know, sometimes you, it, it, it can work within... In other words, what you're trying to do is you're trying to create some sort of space that is your own, basically. And then, and then the other thing, I find it really handy to work for... If I really care about something, it's a really good... Science. So something really, really, really annoys me, and that's a really good place to start with. Um, or, or, you know, something has horrendously embarrassed me. You know, like I've been in some situation, I just felt just awful, and it's been so horrendously embarrassing that even thinking about it, you know, covers me in shame. <laughs> and I think, well, that's, that, this is good. This, there must be something I can, you know, is there something I can write about this? Um, but, you know, the, the danger is you become all about process and you forget to, um, you know, that you forget to still be spontaneous and still try and do new things. So it's a kind of, it's a, con yeah, it's, it's not an easy, uh, I don't think there's any easy, I don't think there's any easy answer to that. It d definitely does change. And I think, um, and it has, you know, to a certain extent, it has to because you know, you've been paid to write the show that's going to be on, you know, that's going to be on in like six months' time. So, you know, you need to write. I mean, at the beginning of a sketch show, you know, it's something crazy. Like, you need to write like two thousand sketches or something ridiculous. I mean, the number is just because there's a. Not only are there a lot of sketches in each episode, but you write, you shoot a lot, you'll write a lot more than you would then um, try out, and then you try out a lot more than you then shoot, you know what I mean? So there's a big process. So, um, and of course, in, when you get to that stage, and you, we, we uh, have always worked with writers as well. So we'd work with, you know, you'd work with other, uh, with other writers and people, and you have all different ways of doing it, uh, writers meetings or people come in and pitch you ideas and then you, you, you know, you chat to them about which ideas might work and you know, maybe you find something you can work on together or, you know, it kind of, uh, you need to open out the process, I guess, then at that point. Um, but it's interesting, but there's, you know, and there's all that, you know, if you want to write something, there is nothing like sitting down in front of a blank piece of paper, you know what I mean? There is that, you know, there has to be that side as well. You have to be able to sit in a chair. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I mean, uh, that's, you know, and you have to, you know, for example, if, 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 if today we were going to write a, a sketch, if all of us here were going to write an, a, a sketch show, an episode of a sketch show, um, then, you know, one thing you can do is you can start out, you know, even without any sketches, you start, well, okay, so we know, let's say it's a, co it's a commercial half hour show, and we know it's going to be 24 minutes long. Half, half of that is going to be titled. So straight away, we only need to write 23 and a half minutes worth of <laughs> sketches. So then we're going to need some short sketches. We know we're going to need, uh, y you know, you're going to need, you know, say half a dozen short sketches. You know, you're going to need, uh, you're going to need some uh, story sketches. You're going to need as many. It's like making muesli, basically. You sit there thinking, what's in muesli? Um, I guess we need some grapes. <laughs> With some, yeah, definitely some oats. Have you ever had muesli without oats? No, I don't, I don't like the oats, do you? We should better have oats anyway. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, uh, you kind of, you, you know, straight away you, you've got restrictions. And I, fi and I find, personally, the more you can restrict yourself to what the idea has to be, the easier it is to come up with an idea. What's really hard is just, oh, let's just make a show about anything. I just want oh, that's just terrifying. <laughs> 
Okay, I'm really sorry because of time constraints. There's only time for one more question. But Ben has really kindly agreed to go to the bar afterwards. So please, all of you join us and you can ask him some more questions. But yeah, final question. Do you want to pick? I don't want it on my <laughs> conscience. Um, <laughs> should we pick someone from the back? Who's got their hand up at the back there? Yeah, hi. <laughs> Thanks for talking to us today. I also did an undergraduate science thing and then became a writer, so I really liked your story. Um, Perfect. You've worn so many different hats um, as like a writer and a comedian and a director. Is there, can you comment on what it's like to move through different roles and can you comment on if there was any one thing that you took up and attempted that kind of scared you or that you were excited to make that change? Yeah, I mean, I... Um I've always done comedy, so to me it always feels like there's, it's all, there's a thread through it all. I mean, even when I wrote science books, you know, I kind of hoped they would also be mu amusing. If not funny, they would be sort of um, funny-ish. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, to me it, it, is, it doesn't feel like many hats to me, it just feels like the same job. And ultimately that job is the person who cares about whether it's good or not. You know, so if you're... Um, whatever part you're doing, you know, if you're acting in something, I'm not the sort of actor who just, just turns up, you know, I, I'm the actor who wants it to be good and want, want to know what I can do, you know, to, to make it good and can we make it better? And when we think we've made it better, can we still, can it still be, can it still be better? That's the point. And I think, um, uh, to go to the last part of your question, the, um, thing that scared and excited me most was was di directing a film so I directed um so I directed a sh I, I did a, about two or three little directing projects on the go so I directed a the pilot of Steve Coogan's show Saxondale and then I directed a short film with Miranda Richardson and then I directed a couple of adverts actually and then I directed a feature film and I really really enjoyed that process I don't think there's in terms of which is the most scary and exciting. I've not done anything that's as scary and exciting as, as directing because, um, particularly in film, not quite so much in TV because TV is more of a producer's medium, but film is entirely a director's medium. And you turn up and just, you know, there's a hundred people and they want to know, they want to know from you what they're going to do that day. So it's a sort of, I, I loved it, do you know what I mean? I absolutely loved it. I slept about four hours a night. I would <coughs> jump out of bed in the morning, just so excited to go to work. I just, I, I, I just absolutely loved it. But it's really, it's really, it, you know, I found it as a, it's difficult, you know, it's really, really difficult. And I, um, I learnt, that's been a nice way to put it, as I learnt a lot. <laughs> during the process, you know what I mean, I'm thinking, really you must remember this for the next time. <laughs> you know, because there's such a lot to learn about that as well, you know, it's a kind of, yeah. So, you know, I highly recommend, uh, I highly recommend that as uh, anyone here giving that a try as well. It's good, it's a very interesting thing to do. Yeah, so like I said, unfortunately, we've run out of time. But also, like I said, please do join us in the bar. I'd like to thank you all for your great questions. And of course, you, Ben, for such an engaging event. So if you all join me in thanking. <laughs>